How's everybody doing this evening? All right. You sound like you're doing awesome. At least three or four of you. So uh, it's good to see you this um, this evening. Want to uh, take your Bibles? Let's turn to Revelation chapter number three, and I want to thank the Cashes for having us over at their house this afternoon. I appreciate the invitation to come over. We're just going to hang out in the office this afternoon, and uh, and uh, they said, "No, no, no, don't do that. Come over and hang out with us for a little bit." And uh, boy, I tell you, we let our hair down and party big time over there, didn't we? <laughs> and uh, had a good time. Had a good time of fellowship and. Um, it was uh, good to get with uh, get with them this afternoon. So thank you for the invitation to, to come over. Hope we didn't get you in too much trouble with Miss Cash and uh, the impromptu invite, but we enjoyed our our time being able to fellowship with uh, you guys this afternoon. So uh, <clears throat> of course uh, next month we're wide open. So if anybody like to <laughs> like to come stay with us back here in the office, we greatly appreciate your company. So. Uh, all right, once again, uh, please don't judge a book by its cover. This is a trial run here um, this evening, so uh, let's make it what we want it to be. Amen? And uh, I would uh, uh, love to hear some feedback. If there's something that you would like to see out of a service like this, uh, we would love to incorporate that into the services. Or if there's time, we're not wanting to be here two hours or anything like that, but uh, if there's anything that you would like to see done or accomplished in a uh, setting like this, I would uh, love to hear back from you, and I'll pass it on to the guys and the leadership team around here and uh, see what, uh, what they think about that, and uh, we'll go from there, amen? And if you say, well, I just don't think we need to do that anymore, then we'll probably just cast that out and, and uh, disregard that. I'm just kidding. We would like to hear from uh, whatever you have and uh, whatever feedback that you may have. So in Revelation chapter number 3 this evening, I really want to um, just read uh, 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 just a couple of verses here. really want to go down to about verse number 4 there. Uh, Revelation chapter number 3, verse number 4. I told you this morning some, uh, some uh, statistics, if you will, turned a, uh, a little bit of a research and some study over decades and decades and decades of church history on uh, what causes churches to get ill, uh, what causes them to sometimes, unfortunately, go under, go out of business, whatever the cause is, whether they, um, they, 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 they financially get uh, overwhelmed or whether they just uh, die out because membership moves on, whatever the situation, you may have even known of a church that has has merged with another church, and uh, that church is maybe sitting vacant nowadays. And we talked about a couple of weeks ago that Jesus told us that the church would never die. We even built that argument. We saw it from Scripture that the church at large will never die. And uh, it won't. It'll keep uh, cruising right along. Amen? But churches do die. And the individual churches, individual congregations, uh, they they shut the doors, they pray their last prayer, they take their last offering. I think I've mentioned those things uh, to you, and uh, that left me wondering, why does that happen? What are some of the telltale signs? Well, I shared with you 10 things this morning. We're not going to go back through that list, but out of those 10 things, I felt led the Lord to elaborate on those last three, and we looked at those things uh, this morning. Now, I hope that what you are able to do is take some of those things and some of that advice Put it on the, jot some of that stuff down on the back of your bulletin and maybe go to your prayer closet and say, Lord, help me to do my part that Winchester First Baptist Church never falls into one of those ruts, never falls into one of those situations where we could be um, showing some signs of some illness. And I think if you were to take a good look at any church, probably some of those things are in any church. So any church, you just put the name on on any one, any church here in town, here in the county, here across the state or across the country, you could probably say those are some of the signs that are in any church. So what does a congregation need to do about that? Seek the Lord and ask the Lord to uh, humbly ask the Lord, help us fix that. Well, where do you go to get that advice? Where do you go to find out what the Lord says about that? Well, it's in our passage this, uh, this evening. 
And it uh, talks specifically about a church that is dead. Specifically, church of Sardis. So you're in Revelation chapter number 3, verses number 1 through 4. And it says, an angel of the church of Sardis write. The angel, that word, uh, angelus, is the word. It means a messenger. And that is the preacher of the church or the pastor of the church. And God so kind to call the pastor the angel, amen, of the church. It, uh, I don't think that applies to me, though. So uh, it says, uh, and to the angel of the church of Sardis write, these things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name or a reputation that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful, strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect, whole, or complete before God. Remember, therefore, um, how you have received and heard and hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and uh, you will not know what hour I will come upon you. I want to, uh, before we get into five or six things this evening, that I just want to quickly uh, talk about this evening because I think I promised you 15 or 20 minutes earlier. I do want to look at a couple of things here, a couple of words here in our text. I want you to look at that word works. Look at uh, verse number uh, two there. Uh, it says, uh, actually, verse number three, uh, excuse me, one there, it says, I know your works. Uh, what Jesus is saying and in, in speaking to John as he's exiled at the, on the Isle of Patmos because of his stand for Jesus Christ. Now somebody, I, I don't know if you've ever put this together, somebody was making visits to John. A courier of some sort was making a visit to John on the Isle of Patmos. And these seven churches was, in an, was, was actually in an ancient mail route. On, uh, if you look at the order of these churches, begins with Ephesus, and the, the loop, the mail loop in, ends with Laodicea. Somebody was running that mail route, if you will. They were corresponding with John, who was exiled, and picking up these letters. He was taking these letters and these messages to these literal, individual, local Bible believing churches. That's what they were in these areas. But he says here specifically about this church. I want you to notice. If you know anything about this passage of Scripture, here you start with a church that in Ephesus was a loveless church. Uh, the church of uh, Smyrna was a persecuted church. The church of Pergamos was a compromising church. The church of Theatira was a corrupted church. And uh, then you get to a dead church here in Sardis, and then the faithful church in Philadelphia, and then the lukewarm church in Laodicea. But if you read through this passage, you, you'll see that he doesn't say that any of those things are taking place in this church of Sardis. He doesn't say you've been corrupted. He doesn't say that you've got false doctrine. He doesn't say any of those things. But he does uh, put a, 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 a serious allegation against them. He says, I know your works. I know what you're doing down there. He says you have a name or a reputation that you're alive, but you're actually dead. Now, what a sobering thought. If you will, what we would call this is playing church or being a hypocrite. He says, you're telling everybody that you have a name, that you're really alive, that you're doing something down there. This tells me that real Christianity, real spirituality is not an outward show. Amen? Uh, because anybody can put on that performance. Anybody can put that show on. He says, I know what you really do. And the word there for, uh, for name, it carries the thought of a reputation. You have a pretty good reputation that you're really doing something. Now, just stepping away from it as the leader of the church at this time, I would want to know and seek in my heart of hearts what God thinks and knows about Winchester First Baptist Church. Amen. I'm not really concerned about a church down the street. I'm not overly concerned about my home church right now in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, because I'm ministering and worshiping and participating and being faithful in attendance here at Winchester. Amen? I'm concerned about what the Lord thinks about this church and this congregation. What does He know about us? What does He know about our heart and our intention and our motives and what we're really doing here in Winchester, Tennessee? 
Do we have a burden for this city? Do we have a burden for this county? Do we have a burden to get missionaries to the four corners of the world and preach the gospel? Do we really have a concern? I hope that our reputation is not that, man, they're alive down there, but the Lord says, yeah, but I know what you really do. I know what you really do. You said, no, Brother Bell, you said you weren't going to speak to us tonight. Well, it's uh, it, about us. It's Sunday night, and I think I can now, right? We're all home folks. It's a spiritual crowd here tonight. So he talks about our works in Sardis. He says, I know what you really do. He talks about the reputation, and they were telling the community that they were something that they really weren't. They were hypocrites in the church is basically what they were, hypocrites. That is a sobering thought if you ask me. And then he gives some advice, and I'm just going to give you these five quick things because I promised, I promised, I promised. Amen? And until somebody gets with me and says, five more minutes, I'll just keep and hold to my promise. Amen? So let me give you these five things. I tried to give you a little snazzy, alliterated outline so you'll remember that this evening. Amen? You're going to have to help me out right back there. Oh, it's the O-N-O-F-S week. Praise the Lord. All right, number one, I want you to write this down. Look at verse number two, the first part there. He says to be stirred up. Get stirred up. Look at verse number two. Be watchful. Be watchful. It means to be alert or to look alive. In the military, we tell our guys all the time, look alive, look alive. Hey, wake up over there, wake up. This is a church that's dead. Let me ask you something. You ever gone to the cemetery and said, hey, we all you people wake up? Will you look alive out here? I don't know if you remember going through the scriptures, but every funeral service that Jesus attended, he broke that up, amen? Matter of fact, he went to the grave of Lazarus after he'd been dead for four days, and he said, Lazarus come forth. Somebody said one time before, how come he had to say Lazarus? If he hadn't said Lazarus come forth, the whole graveyard had got up. Amen. But he said Lazarus come forth. He's saying to wake up and look alive here. Be watchful and be alert. He's saying I want you to realize the shape that you're in. He said you say that you're alive. You have a reputation that you're alive. You have a reputation that you're doing a lot of fantastic things, but I know your works and you're dead. Now, we understand that the thought here is that there is spiritual death here. Matter of fact, Ephesians chapter number 2 says that we're dead in our trespasses and sins. So this tells me that in this congregation, there was an overwhelming majority of lost people that were in Sardis. Now, if you read through the remainder of that text and that context there, talking about Sardis, you see that he says that there are some there that have a good name and a good reputation or walk, walk with me in white robes and so on and so forth, which tells me that there was a handful of people that truly knew Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. He's going back almost six centuries to reference something here about this town, Sardis. Matter of fact, Sardis sat in the mountains about at, at an elevation of about 1,500 feet. And uh, the back, it was part of the Lydian Empire back in the 5th century B.C., and it was ruled by King Croesus. And it was a very wealthy city. Matter of fact, that town is still there. It's called uh, Sart, and it is in Turkey. These churches, are, of course, are in Asia Minor. And they thought that that city was absolutely uh, just uh, impregnable, if you will. You could not, that city could not be defeated and they were lulled to sleep. Matter of fact, it was said of, of um, the, uh, the, the city of Sardis in the Lydian Empire that even a child could defend that city because it was situated and arranged in the foothills there. And on one side of the city was nearly a thousand foot cliff that was nearly impossible to scale. But they found that somewhere around the mid-5th century of B.C. that somebody did scale that. And the Persians came in and they overran that city. It also happened in the 2nd century again B.C. to this very same city. They'd fallen asleep again. Now here the church is dead and Jesus Christ is saying, hey, will you wake up? Remember your history. Remember what happened 600 years ago. Do you remember what happened 300 years ago? Wake up, stir up to any dead church, Jesus says, will you look alive? Will you get stirred? Number two, not only does he say stir up, but he says, secondly, strengthen up. Strengthen up. Verse number two, it says, in strengthen, it means to confirm. 
the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have, fa- I have not found your works perfect before God. If he's saying use it or lose it, is what he's saying. If you want 21st century vernacular, use it or lose it. He's saying strengthen the things that remain. Strengthen up. If you will, he's saying you need to take personal inventory here. Evaluate where you are. He's saying stir up and then strengthen up. I'm going to tell on myself I have uh, recently signed up a gym membership and have a personal trainer. In a couple of weeks I'm going to be so buff. I mean I'm going to have muscles and muscles on top of muscles. Amen. Jeff acts like he's not buying that one. (laughs) Sinful rascal. So, my dear bride is with me right beside me as we work out. (laughs) Yesterday, he, uh, Brother Kyle, he had us in the gym and we had this medicine ball thing. And we'd pick it up off the floor and then we'd toss it up on the wall and then we'd catch it and we'd put it back down and We'd toss it up again. We'd put it back down. We'd do about six or eight of them. Had to throw it up to a certain place on the wall. And then we'd go over here and we'd pick up this kettle. Kettlebell, kettlebell. You know what I'm talking about, right? (laughs) We'd lift this thing up. And we did that six or eight times. And then we had to get up on this stair thing. And we'd step up there. And I got so confused because I had to put my, it looked like an awkward square dance, brother. I mean, it was so weird. I'd have to get up on that thing, and then I'd step off of it, and he said, now go up with your other foot, and I couldn't remember which foot went first and which foot went next. I just got so discombobulated, and when I was doing that, Kim was walking down with the kettlebell and coming back. Then we'd have to swap out and all of that. We're strengthening ourselves. We're tuning ourselves up. We had taken an evaluation that, hey, we got a little plump over the holidays, amen? Had a little bit too much of that banana pudding, maybe a little bit too much of that Uh, turkey and dressing and all that over Thanksgiving. We just got lazy is what happened. So here's what he's telling the church. He's saying, will you confirm and strengthen up and get your act together? Strengthen up. Strengthen up. Any church that is really concerned about their health will evaluate on a monthly or quarterly basis. Hey, where are we in this situation? How are we doing in our outreach? How are we doing in our prayer life as a church? How are we doing in our discipleship? How is the the preacher doing? I I welcome your feedback. I welcome your feedback. Hey, listen, when I pastored in Dixon, I'd have people tell me, I've had, my my stepfather told me one time, we're not going to make 15 minutes. I, I lied, okay? I had my stepfather tell me one time. He came to me and he said, uh, he said, Craig, let me tell you something. I'm going to be honest with you. I said, all right. He said, that wasn't your best one this morning. I said, okay. He said, matter of fact, I don't believe half that stuff you even said. I said, well, it came from the Bible. He said, yeah, but I don't think you gave it right, though. I don't think you said it right. I just kind of looked around, and somebody else was like, he might be right about that. You know, I just had to suck it up and take it. Now, he was wrong, but uh, nevertheless, I'll take some feedback. I think that makes me a better preacher if you come to me and say, hey, Brother Bell, uh, uh, here's, uh, here's another approach. Here's another thing that you could add into that one. And in in in, in, I, I think it's healthy to make these evaluations. It's healthy to take these checkups. It's healthy to strengthen up the church. And that's what he's telling Sardis here. He says, I want you to stir up and strengthen up. And then he says to smarten up. Amen? Verse 3 uh, uh, B there, or 3A says, remember... The thought there in the original language is not only remember, but also remember and respond. Remember, therefore, how or what you have received and heard, or what you have learned, what you have learned. Don't forget about those things. Never forget about that sweet day and that sweet hour where you met Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Don't ever forget that. I hope that if the Lord allows me to have a right mind, when I'm 95 years old, I can remember September 24th, 1991. Amen. I hope that I always remember that day. 
You say, why is that, Brother Bell? It, it, the reason, I mean, just the basic reason is because when the devil jumps right straddle on my back sometimes and tries to tell me that I'm a failure and God don't love me, I can run him right back to that date and I can say, ha, 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 I am victorious and more than a conqueror through Christ who loved me. Amen? Listen, it's good to understand those things and remember those things and respond and say, hey, we're a body of baptized believers. We are conquerors in Christ, and God has given us a commission to take on the entire world with the gospel, and we're empowered with the Holy Spirit, and we can get the job done. Stir up, strengthen up, and spartan up is what he's telling these believers. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. He says, you're close, for I've not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Remember those things. Smarten up. Never forget when you get saved. Never forget the, how the God trained you and taught you. That needs to continue in the work of the Lord. Now, next, he says, and stand up. Stand up. I like that word or that phrase, hold fast. It carries the thought of, you, you remembered it, you're responding, now guard it. Keep it. Guard it. Hold fast. Take a stand to obey or to guard or to maintain or to conform, if you will. Hold what you got. Hold on to it. Never let it slip away. You say, well, back in the day we had a revival. Have a revival today. Amen. You say, well, back in the 70s was a good time. Hey, 2019's a good time, amen? You say, well, you remember that meeting we had back there in 1989? I don't, but let's have a good one in 2019, amen? Hold on and, and stand up and do something great for God. I tell you, I, it, it's time that the church does take some bold stands, amen? One crowd runs out of the closet and all the Christians run into it tire, and, and scared to take a stand and, uh, and scared to, uh, uh, to, to talk about Jesus anymore. Take a stand for Jesus Christ, amen? Take a stand for Jesus Christ. Take a stand for the Word of God, the inerrant, infallible, inspired Word of God, amen? Take a stand. Take a stand. Make a big deal out of your church. Lift up your church. You don't have to run down a church in the neighborhood. Lift up your church. Lift up your preacher. Lift up your Lord. Lift up your deacons. I mean, just, just make a big deal out of this place. Man, I mean, take a stand for the cause of Christ. He says to stand up. So we're stirring up. We're strengthening up. We're smartening up. I need to work on that myself. We're standing up. And then lastly, he says, how about straighten up? Amen. Let's straighten up. You see that there? Repent. He says, I want you to remember, therefore, how you received and heard, hold fast, and repent. And repent. I think I illustrated that to you before. This is repentance. Hey, I know your works. I know what you're doing down there. You have a reputation. You have a name that you're alive, but you're really dead. But let me give you some advice. That's repentance. Instead of going that old way to the cemetery, go over there where it's dead, I'm going to go over here where there's life. That's literally what, re what repentance is. Taking a 180 degree turn. You say, well, what happens if a church doesn't do that? What happens? Look at the next verse. Therefore, if you will not watch, I mean, that's really where it all comes. That's where it all starts, right? If you won't wake up, I mean, you can't strengthen it. You can't strengthen somebody who won't wake up, won't snap to, won't, won't look alive. You know, you, you, can't, you can't get them to smarten up. You can't get them to stand up. I mean, that's where it starts, right? You got to get them to wake up first. Wake up. He says, therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief. And you will not know what hour I will come upon you. I think you could go back to the church of Ephesus there in, in Revelation chapter number 2. And he tells them that if they don't wake up, that he will literally come in and remove the candlestick or the light or their ministry and effectiveness from that church. And he'll put it somewhere else where they are going to do the job. 
I showed you pictures, I think, back in September. I stood in Ephesus in 1992. There is no church there. There is no light there. There is no gospel witness there. I stood in that place. I shudder to think that there is no church there in Sart, Turkey today either. The church of Sardis is long gone. Well, why do some churches die and why do they go out of business? Well, we looked at those 10 things today. But Jesus says that we can change things. How do we do that, Brother Barrow? Stir up, strengthen up, think of me in that medicine ball, tossing it up there on that wall, doing that crazy dance on that little step, strengthening up, smartening up, standing up, and then straightening up. Change. Change what you're doing. Change how you think. Going forward, marching victoriously under the bloodstained banner of the cross. Amen?